Okay, my name is Jim Brain, and yeah, so you're in the front, you're going to get yelled at, right? Um, so some of you may know who I am. I do quite a bit of Commodore hardware development and stuff. Um, today I'm going to talk about a little side project that happened on one of the uh, mailing lists, actually started on one of the mailing lists, Commodore mailing lists this year, um, and basically is trying to unearth some source code, um, actually object code, that's been hidden in one of Commodore's uh, CPUs for probably over the last 30 years. Um, and so I want to tell you kind of how we got to the point where we are right now and kind of show you what kind of information we found. So I titled it The Buried Code Treasure because it is, uh, it's, it's basically, it's interesting after all these years to finally have something kind of new that's not been found as yet. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff investigated, especially on some of the Commodore machines. Um, most of the Vic mode, SID stuff, everything has been taken care of, but if we cast the net just a little bit wider to the 6502 space, not necessarily Commodore computers per se, but definitely stuff that Moz technology took care of over the years, then there's definitely a, uh, there's definitely some interesting things still available, and this is one of those things. <coughs> so Moz technology, the 6500 slash one, is probably a CPU that very few people know about. It's kind of obscure. Um, in its heart, there is a 6502 running in this chip. It's a 40-pin DIP chip, um, integrated circuit. It's a essentially a what we would now call a microcontroller. So nowadays, you see a lot of the projects in these various rooms that use microcontrollers, typically from uh, microchip or from Atmel, an AVR microcontroller or a PIC microcontroller. Um, this was Commodore's microcontroller, 6500-1. It contains, uh, as I indicate in here, a 6502 core. It also contains 20, it's 2,048 bytes of ROM. Okay, not not uh, not 10K, not 8K, not 6K, not 4K, but 2K of ROM, and then a whopping 64 bytes of RAM. Okay. In addition, it had four I/O ports that it could use to communicate uh, with the outside world. So 32 bits on this, or 32 uh, pins on this particular 40 pin IC were dedicated to input and output information. In addition, it had some interesting, had some interrupt modes and so forth, and of course, inside the unit is a complete 6502 operational. <clears throat> These are some of the applications for the 6500-1. You'll see many of them are keyboard processors for the Amiga line, um, but the ones that were probably most interesting to me, at least at this point, is because I know everybody has, as one of the doorstops in their house, a 1520. And I happen to have one right here for those of you who forget what a 1520 looks like. So this is, uh, uh, this is the 40 column, not even a full page of paper plotter that Commodore unsuccessfully marketed in the 80s, I believe. Um, and they must have manufactured a whole ton of these because we see them all the time and nobody uses them, right? The pens are hard to find. Um, nobody really took this particular plotter seriously. Um, but they live on, so they're, they're around. People use them for various things. I, some of these, I try to give these away sometimes. They don't have a lot of takers, so, you know, not a lot of love for the, for the, for the 1520 plotter. But one of the things that the 1520 plotter does have is... Let's see if I can get this open enough so you can see. So it has a very small circuit board inside and see what chip is missing, right? That's the heart of the plotter is the 6500 slash 1. So think about all the things that a plotter needs to do, right? You need to communicate with the IEC port so you get your data from a VIC-20 or a Commodore 64. And then that data basically says draw a line from here to there, but it might just send text, right? It might say print this line of text. Hi, how are you? So that plotter needs to communicate, receive that data from the, uh, from the IEC port on a Commodore 64 or Commodore VIC-20, and then turn that text into plotter commands to put text on this paper right here. And of course, be able to change pins, be able to handle the fact that you're dealing with a mechanical system, so you've got to, as you get to the end of the line, you need to wait until the plotter can come back to the beginning so that you can draw, and so there's stepper motor constants and so forth in there, all contained in that 2048 bytes of ROM and 64 bytes of RAM. Now the keyboard processors probably is a little bit less interesting, uh, basically translating the keyboard matrix and some of the Amiga keyboards into something a little bit more uh, 
um, easy to digest by Amiga OS. <coughs> Here's the problems. There's no copy of the source code that's inside the masked ROM. The ROM was defined by Commodore or by whoever. You could order the 6500 slash one um, as any, any, uh, any customer could order and they would deliver a 2048 byte uh, uh, object code file to Commodore and Commodore would actually create the masks and mask program the ROM in there, just like the, the kernel and basic ROMs in the Commodore line of computers. Unfortunately, unlike a kernel or basic ROM in the computers, you can't just pop the 40 pin IC out of the 1520 plotter, for instance, drop it in your friendly uh, EEPROM reader and read the code out, right? The functionality has been replicated, for instance, but there's no way to verify the system. But there is a clue. In the data sheet, and this is a copy of the respective paragraph of the data sheet. It talks about a special test mode. But this is the total sum of the information available on the test mode, right? You can read it right there. Special test logic, which we are not going to tell you about, provides a method for thoroughly testing this unit. Tells you a voltage, tells you where to put it, tells you nothing else, right? So now this chip was manufactured in the late 70s, early 80s. And so as a result, with this being the only information available, and, and also no real idea on how to do this full testing, right? Um, the information's been locked inside the chip for uh, the last 30 years. So from time to time, the question comes up on various mailing lists. In 2007, 6502.org had a question, hey, can we use the test mode to read this information out of the chip? In 2012, same topic, hey, I'd like to get the plotter uh, vector um, uh, character map out of the plotter. Can we use the test mode to get that information? Finally, in 2014, another, archive, another uh, topic came up saying, hey, has anybody read out the Amiga keyboard controller, mm -hmm. which uses the same type of CPU? Mm -hmm. And that was the one that caught my eye. Basically, I thought, wow, is this, you know, is this like something that you're never going to be able to do? <coughs> But a plan was hatched. In 2012 and in 2014, um, this individual, and I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce his name, Soki is the way that you know, he, he refers to himself, and that's fine. He had represented both in the 2012 and 2014 threads, suggesting that there be a second processor connected to the 6500-1, basically a newer style microcontroller, to drive the 6500-1. Basically to say, you know what, I'm going to... I'm going to take over and drive this particular CPU to do what it needs to do, and then I'm going to read the data out of it. So that, you know, probably not, a, not an earth-shattering suggestion. A lot of people probably would have come up with the same thing. But these are the types of things that would need to be done. The second processor is going to have to activate the test mode, and it's going to become the master CPU. The 6500-1 will be the slave CPU. It needs to store a program in RAM on the 6500-1 with no ability to tell whether that storage in RAM has succeeded or failed. Then, once it's stored the program in RAM, it needs to turn off test mode, making sure, by the way, making sure that the next opcode that's going to be retrieved by the 6500-1 is the spot in RAM where the program has been stored. Remember, there's no way to drive the program bus. There's no way to tell the system where to, there's no way to put reset vectors in the system. Absolutely nothing like that. Then it needs to switch into slave mode. Somehow it needs to synchronize with the uh, 6500 slash one so that when data is coming back, it can read that data at the appropriate time and then display it out for the user. So you can see there, I've kind of broken it down, six steps that needs to be occurring on this to be successful. Well, here's some of the uncertainties. Guess what? Just because you drive a clock into the 6500 slash one does not mean that's the clock it's using. Actually, internally, it's divided by two. So the unit can take a 2 to 6 megahertz clock. Internally, he uses that as a 1 to 3 megahertz CPU clock. But the problem is you don't know which phase of the clock it actually uses for an opcode refresh, right? Does it use when the initial clock is doing its first batch of, of uh, you know, 1 and 2, and then it does the fetch? 
or does it fetch right at the very beginning? You have no way of knowing. And there's no information. As I showed you earlier, the test logic, you saw the total sum of information that we had to go on. The second one is how to switch the test mode off while you're in the middle of a program. It's pretty easy to turn test mode on because you drive the CPU to reset and then you immediately go to test mode. But when you drop out of test mode, how do you know when to drop out of test mode? And how do you know what the CPU is going to do when you do drop out of test mode? And then the other one is how to synchronize the incoming opcode. So when the CPU is driven to reset and you start, you got to realize you don't have any idea where it is in the program when you start. You don't know how many cycles it's going to take before the system has initialized and it's starting to read data or starting to read opcodes. So these are three. But here's the largest obstacle at the bottom. The main obstacle to this is there's six individual steps that need to occur in order for this to be successful. As the number of steps increases, the amount of, success, the amount of probability for success decreases. Here's some key contributions. <clears throat> These things really turned the potential or low probability or potential for failure into a great potential for success. One is Greg King suggested we didn't need to write a program to RAM and then have the program in RAM read the data out. Greg suggested just drive a program that reads the data right from the initial. So instead of trying to write a program and store it into RAM, just have a program run and deliver the data right back to the I.O. ports directly. So don't even bother with RAM. Right? The second key is Garrett created a special set of self-synchronizing opcodes. So that no matter where you were in your data, in your opcode train, these set of opcodes would get you to the appropriate boundary, and then from that point forward, you would know where the CPU was. <clears throat> Here's self-synchronization. So once the unit steps out of reset and it goes into test mode, you start off with a bunch of NOP opcodes. And the number is not necessarily that important. Just do enough so that you can be assured that all reset vectors have been fetched, all initial work has been happening, the, uh, the stack has been set up, everything has happened, and you're ready to go. Then you do these four magic bytes right here, 2C, 24, EA, and then XX, which is a don't care. So if the opcodes pull right at the very beginning, then this, this particular four bytes of opcode translates into a bit EA224. If you're too early, then you'll do EA 2C 24 EA, and if you're two bytes too early, then you'll do uh, t e you'll do EA EA 2C, and then you'll end up with your NOP here, or sorry, your one over, and so you'll end up, and then you'll do 2C 24, and then you'll do the EA, which is just a NOP, and then you'll have the NOP it takes two cycles, and then at the end of this sequence of bytes, you're ready to go. Here's a prototype schematic. So the unit was driven by an AVR Atmel, uh, Atmel AVR Mega 32, which happened to be in my parts box. And then here is the 6500 slash 1. Probably the most interesting thing here is on the right hand side. This right hand side is the special circuitry that's needed because guess what? The test mode doesn't get its own pin. Test mode has to be driven through the same pin as reset. So they've overloaded a pin. Specifically, whoops, the overloaded pin. So this is the circuitry that has to be used. For one, all the transistors here are used to isolate the 5-volt logic that's used on the rest of the, rest of the 6500 slash 1 and the AVR from the 10-volt logic over here at the end, the 10-volt logic that's going to be used to drive the system into test mode. So for one, you have to get 10 volts to the system, and then you have to do this sort of translation right here in order to make sure that when this line at the bottom is high, then this transistor will turn on right here, which will drive this transistor to, this transistor will be off. And then on reset side, when this transistor turns on, reset will be driven low. So with this on, reset mode is turned off, with this off, the reset mode, this is driven to plus uh, 10 volts, which drives 10 volts all the way into the reset pin. So when this one is turned on, reset will enable and drag reset all the way to, to zero volts. And so that's how, you, that's how you can shift between reset, 5 volt operation, which is normal, 
and 10 volts, which is test mode. So I skipped over the actual hardware, but this is it. So it doesn't look very pretty, but it was, uh, it was an evening's worth of, uh, of wiring on a breadboard. <clears throat> and then the solution. <clears throat> Had some initial issues, fixed those. Um, Garrett provided some test code to allow us to write a byte to one of the four I.O. registers that were on the uh, that was on the 6500 one, and so that unit was was performed successfully, and then the code was initial was immediately reorganized to transmit a ROM data byte. Um, uh, first was changed to do a ROM data byte, so I read a byte out of the ROM and, and wrote it to the uh, the I/O register, and then immediately switched into sequencing 256 times. The code is a very brute force approach. What I do in the initial prototype of the code is I drive the system into reset, wait a little bit of time, immediately drive it into test mode, I submit the information to read one byte of data, I read that byte of data from the ROM, and then I drive the system back into reset and start all over again, right? So basically, I and to read 256 bytes of data off of the system, I basically reset the CPUs 256 times. <clears throat> and every time I write a program that's exactly 20 bytes long, most of which are not code, op codes, and the rest of it is just those like three or four bytes of, of actual, de uh, actual uh, program code to synchronize and then read a byte from ROM and write it to one of the registers and then immediately jam the CPU. <clears throat> there are the results. The ROM is 2,048 bytes, and so there is 2,048 bytes of source code or object code right there. Um, the individual in the beginning who had suggested um, uh, uh, suggested some of the self-synchronization and, and, and doing the, uh, actually it was Soki had, had suggested doing the second, secondary processor. He's also a whiz at doing disassembly, and so he took the object code and quickly disassembled it into source code. So now we have the source code for the 65, or sorry, the 1520 plotter. Here's the key findings. This entire 96 byte of, uh, and one of the key findings, there's a number one in there, but I thought this was the most interesting one. 1,322 bytes comprises that entire vector bitmap, or entire vector uh, character set. It's very ingenious how they've stored it in there. There's not enough time in our presentation today, but I invite you to look at the source code to see how compactly they store the vector uh, information necessary to draw all those characters. Is it less than, uh, is each point like less than a byte? Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of it's double. Less. It's kind it's kind of more than one information, more than one piece of information in a byte. So the byte has, it's split up. Like there's one bit that tells about you know pin up or pin down, and then there's another one that tells should I go this direction or that one, and then there's like an offset. So it knows that you're going to put the pin here, and then you're going to go so far around. So that's how the information is represented. And then there's basically a, a byte for every stroke that you have. So like for instance. This would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight strokes, I think. And this is like two strokes and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> or three strokes, sorry. And did you know from the source then too of how did you go did you reverse engineer the format of the recorder? Did you just look at it and figure out the bytes? No, we they reversed it. They were engineered, he's got it all set up as to how it does that. And then this actually was created through S this is a vector right. graphics that was done based on the information right. from the source code. Very cool. So these are some additional completed activities. Um, there was two actual, I didn't know this, but there are two actual ROMs, or two actual versions of the 6500 slash one. They're in the plotters. One is a dash 01 and one's a dash 03. And so both of those have been dumped. Both of the source code, or object code files have been reverse engineered into source code. Um, there's only nominal differences between the two. Um, some timing fixes on the second one, some items where it looked like there have been challenges with the plotter on certain uh, uh, plotter mechanisms, getting the, the motors, waiting enough time for the motor to come all the way back to the left-hand side, or the fact that the stepper motor wasn't going as fast as they initially thought it was going to. <clears throat> also, um, Garrett, the individual who had provided the synchronization bytes, um, delivered to me an Amiga controller, 6570 Amiga controller, and I was able to read that data out as well. And then uh, they also worked on refactoring the code 
so that I didn't do the brute force approach. So now the latest code <coughs> um, actually stores a program in RAM, like the original idea is store a program in RAM that will loop through all 2048 bytes of ROM and deliver all that information out to one of the I.O. ports and then the, the, the Atmel AVR will simply read all that data as one, <coughs> as one chunk of data and, and display it. But the advantage we have is one of the 6570 controllers uh, that Garrett delivered to me, we believe, has a, has a bad RAM, has a bad RAM segment. And so the brute force approach will continue to work, but the, but the secondary approach where it needs RAM in order to store the program temporarily, that will fail. And so in that particular, pro that particular controller, I can read it out using the more of a brute force approach, but it will not work using the, uh, um, using the secondary approach or the, the more kind of elegant code base. Um, it's unclear whether the RAM is truly bad or not, but that's one of the things that we, we thought might be at issue. <clears throat> the fact is there's very little way of interacting with the 6502 core in the system, so it's very hard to understand what exactly is going wrong. And then I also constructed a second, a little bit more durable prototype, and so I have that prototype here today. And there you go, that is a 6500-1 reader. So probably the only one in the world at this point in time. No problem. Yeah, whoa! <laughs> Yeah, well, the first one is still sitting on my breadboard at the house. So if I need it, then, then I can go back to it if I want. But it soon won't be because, as you all know from breadboards, that more time goes on, the less stable they are. So the so wire is going to get pulled at some point. So that, in fact, is uh, reading out the 30-year-old code in the 6500-1 uh, uh, plotter controllers and the uh, keyboard controllers. The source code is available and it's been stored online. Uh, version of this talk is also available online. Uh, Silver Dream, which is one of the individuals that was asking for this, uh, uh, the Amiga controller to be read out, has compiled all this information and put it online. And I encourage you to look at the source code because, um, like I said, for basically under a thousand bytes, uh, they were able to implement an entire plotter and communication mechanism, which is pretty impressive. Um, if you ask me. So, any questions? Yes? Uh, is, are those all of the known devices? Yeah, go back to that table at the beginning. Are those all of them? I mean, is there a confirmed list, like in some Commodore document that says we use this in all of these only? Or, or could there still be other things out there? So let me answer that question with a question. Do you know of anywhere else where Commodore gave a definitive list on anything? So I know I, I'm not aware. These are just ones that we're reasonably sure that these are. This is the complete list. But I I would not I would not want to bet a significant amount of cash on that. <clears throat> yeah. I still don't get how you. <laughs> so, when the system is in test mode, um, the system will read its opcode data from, actually it reads all data, the, the pre, I think the understanding is the entire data bus is wired directly to one of the I.O. ports, the C, the I.O. port C. So I, I should have put that in there. So in test mode, I think it says in the, in the, in the readout though, it says, Basically, that the, the information, um, yeah, port PC. So that's they call it port PC, but it's it's basically port C on there's four ports A, B, C, and D. So port C is where the CPU expects to get its data that it normally would get from the data bus. So basically, when you drive the when you drive the test pin, it disconnects the internal data bus from the CPU and connects the data bus to port C directly. And so it expects to send everything in through port C. <clears throat> so what you do is, let's say for instance, you need to do a, an immediate uh, a, a load of a, uh, let's say you're gonna load a zero page uh, value from ROM. Let's say, let's assume that ROM was in zero page just to make it easier for, for uh, the system. So. In, in, the, uh, in the code, you would drive the test mode high and then do whatever you're going to do to synchronize. And then you would issue whatever the opcode is for load from zero page, whatever, whatever, whatever opcode that is. I don't have it off the top of my head. 
So that's a byte that you would transmit to port C at the appropriate time. And then you would, the AVR is actually generating the clock signal. So you know exactly when the clock is going to happen. So you put something on port C, and then you drive the clock high, and then you drive it low, which means the, which means the internal CPU has went through half a clock cycle. And then you drive the, drive the clock high again, and then you drive it low, and then you know that you went through a whole internal cycle. And then the second thing that you do is you, you then put the, the app code's variable, or the value, on the data bus, because you're now you're on cycle two. And so in a, in a, in a 6500, or in a, in a 6502, the second cycle would be what zero page location do you want to load from? So let's say we want to load from hex 83. So you would load, you, in that second cycle, you would store an 83 to port C. And then you would go, the clock would go high, low, high, low, right? So that's two cycles. Then, and here's where you have to understand, then remember that load from zero page is a two byte, three cycle operation, right? So the program counter is not going to advance, but the CPU takes one more cycle to do the work. So then you have to transmit a third byte onto port C and drive the, and drive the clock high, low, high, low. You don't care what that board is, port, uh, what that value is, because the CPU is not watching the, the, the port C at that point. And you can transmit the same one. In fact, I do. I just I transmit the same byte again. I basically say, you know what, if, I, if it was 83, then I'm going to transmit 83 again. That doesn't matter. Then what you, but what you do for that last byte is you drop out of test cycle. So opcode in test cycle, opcode value in test cycle, clock high, clock low, clock high, clock low, not in test cycle. And so what it does then is, is it, you reconnect the data bus to ROM. So the opcode has got stored in there, and the CPU says, I need to load from location 83. Am I connected to the data bus? Yes. OK, port line 83 will be the ROM. So I'll read that data in. Then you immediately turn the test cycle back on. And then you say, OK, now store that data. right? So the next opcode, you drive test cycle again, test high, and you say, store this data to port A, let's say. So you say store to port A, and then you store, and then you drop out a test cycle, or drop out a test mode, and the store happens to port C, to actual port C, as opposed to uh, nowhere, right? So. At that point, your controller reads it? Yeah, at that point, at the controller, because the controller knows where it is in the cycle, because yeah. it says, oh, I wrote a byte, I wrote the opcode, I wrote the value, I wrote a dummy, I wrote the store, I wrote port, and port C is in zero page, so, so it's a two byte, three cycle operation. So I know I, on that, I, I wrote the store, I wrote the port 80 or what, whatever, the, whatever the register value is, and then the next dummy cycle, as I'm going through that next dummy cycle, because the store is a, three, is a two byte, three cycle operation, during that dummy cycle, I read port A off of the off of the uh, uh, 6500 slash one. I read that port, and then there's my data. And then immediate, and then on the brute force version of the code, I immediately jam the CPU, wait a little bit, put it back in reset, and start the whole process over internally, sending a new uh, value to to uh, uh, to read from. So what I did basically in the opcode, if you look in the code that I have that I used on the AVR, the code I'm sending to the 6502 is load, it's like A9, or no, A9 is immediate, right? But whatever it is, it's the opcode, it's, it's the opcode for a full, um, uh, you know, non-zero page read, so the, the three byte, four cycle read. So I load, and then the low byte is a counter that I'm generating, you know, I've, I have I going from zero to 255, so, so next opcode is I, and then the, and then the next byte is whatever page I'm reading. So I would read one page at a time. So I basically, in the brute force approach, I would write the code to read from uh, the, the ROM starts at 800 and goes to FFF. So I would do, um, the code would send out 800, 801, 802, dot, 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 AFF. And then I'd recompile the code for 9. And then I'd be 9, 0, 0, 9, you know, it's brute force, right? So that the refactored code will go through and do the whole thing. But in that case, it, 
The reason I had to do that is because the timing, even though this unit is only operating at one megahertz, um, the lowest it can go is 100 kilohertz. The, low, the slowest speed that the CPU can operate at is 100 kilohertz. So I generated a clock at 250 kilohertz external, which means 125 kilohertz internal. And I figured that gave a little bit of margin. And at 125 kilohertz internal, I just had enough time to get to take care of what I needed to take care of. If I added the additional loop to go do more than one page, I fell out of sync. So if I'd have used a faster controller, that probably wouldn't have been an issue, but I was running at the top end of what I could do. I had the system clocked to 16 megahertz on the AVR side just so I could keep up with things. So it was easier just to read one byte, yeah. recompile, do it again. Hmm? And that's why you had to jam it. Yep, I just jammed it and then started over a brute force. Yeah? Uh, what controller did you use? An, an AT Mega 32, an AVR, 8 bit microcontroller. Oh, and also, um, am I getting this right? The uh, self synchronization code that's uh, three opcodes in one, depending on where you start, and it executes something completely different? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, to the other kids. Uh, this, could you show me the slide again? Um, it looks like it's. Yep, it is. Bit command. It's bit command. Whoops. There you go. Well, a bit command basically reads some data from either immediate or reads some data from a register and whatnot and does some internal calculations and set the register, set some of the, the bits like it'll, it'll, it'll do a calculation. Well, somebody else could probably give a better idea of what it does. But in this case, we don't really care what the bit command does. The only thing we care about is the fact that the bit command, ten, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect things and it can be used in multiple ways, right? It can be used in a... Uh, in a one byte or in a three byte mode or a two byte mode, and it's used commonly in, in demos and whatnot yeah. to try and synchronize. Because if you if you need to be two bytes or three, you know if you need to be two cycles or three cycles or three cycles or four cycles, you can use the bit command in this way. So it's pretty common to use this uh, to get that synchronization. It can jump in at any point. Yeah. And and still can use up those cycles. Yeah. Because I was going to say if that cleverness is uh, that unique, then it belongs in the jargon. No, no, this is not, yeah. The, the big thing was, it was kind of adding the pieces together. It was doing this, and then doing the self-synchronization, and then remembering. See, this is the big key. <coughs> Even if you look on the archives, when Garrett first sent this information out, he forgot that when you're, when you're writing code for a 6502, you can assume that in the code... You're gonna. It's gonna be this va this this location in memory, this location in memory, this location in memory. And if the computer needs another cycle to do something, that's okay. When it comes back, it'll look. It'll be looking for data at the next position. But when you're doing things inside the system, you have to count the cycles, not the opcodes, right? I mean, it's demo demo coding and, and high speed operations probably does the same thing. It's probably the same kind of mindset. But Garrett messed it up initially. If you look at the mailing list. He forgot to put all of the dummies, dummy states in, or the, the dummy cycles in. And so he had, this is actually the final uh, information, but in, in, in an earlier version of this, he didn't have all the XO, XXs where they needed to be. And he's like, oh, hold on, I made a mistake. So it's very complicated. You have to remember that you're going to do this command, but then this command is going to get executed here, So, but you need to clock in. You still need something there. You need something, you need to do something there, and then you need to continue on with your with your program. So there was a lot of inter, a lot of interlocking pieces that had to work together in order to make this successful. Um, and that's the reason why when I talked initially, all of this right here of, um, you know, performing all these steps, right? <coughs> Test mode, you store a program, you have no idea whether it really stored because you don't know whether the program actually, you don't know whether you were able to catch the CPU so that you got control of it. Then you got to go out of test mode and you got to wait for your program to run, but you don't have any idea if it actually ran, <coughs> right? Debugging was before. Yeah, yeah, debugging like non-existent, right? Yeah. So, so you could check the version that actually the final version and put it in RAM. By, you could check that with the root force. That's right, and I did. I did. I checked the I checked the code <coughs> to make sure, and then I, of course I dumped the code a number of times. And I mean the code's very distinct. So and. Of course, when we, when we got it done, and, and like I said, that individual started de reverse engineering or disassembling it, it was 
you know, it, it became very clear very quickly that it was actual code and it was in it was in good shape. Yeah. How much? What was the speed difference between the brute force mode versus the refined mode? Um, well, the refined mode was was obviously faster because in the brute force pro mode, I was most resetting it. Constantly. Well, but, but the is thing it like is, ten is seconds per reset or is no, it no, no. The day no, all, all of these happened like okay. that. I mean, it was it was nuts. The only problem with the, the only problem with the brute force approach is once it got done, it just continued looping. No. So what would happen is, I would have to I would put the system in hard reset, the the controller into reset. And I would set up, it, it outputs to a serial port on the controller. So I would set, I have a program that was, that was watching the, the serial port. And I would clean out the serial, or uh, sorry, not clean out, but set up a capture. And then I would make sure there was no bytes in that capture. So the capture start, and then I would, I would pull the controller out of reset, and it would just start streaming bytes. And so I set it to, hey, you know, after 1,000 or 2,000 bytes, quit, right? Then you'd have to go into an editor, and you'd have to say, okay, well, only the first 256 of these are real, right? The rest of them are just duplicates. And so then you'd have to chop it, oh. and then you'd have to save it off. And then, I mean, it was a very time consuming process. But remember, the goal initially was can you just actually get it to work, right? right? You make it look better later, but that was the way that I originally got the information. And then when the, re when the refactored approach was there, it actually goes through and it says uh, the internal code that I wrote on RAM, it says, you know what, loop from 800 to FFFF, and when you loop around, quit. So I know that I'm only going to get this many bytes. So it wasn't for speed of dumping, it was for speed of post-processing. Yeah, it was. I got it. Yeah, yeah, post-processing. And I had it down at the end there. You know, once I had gone, I was like, you know, I, 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 could do, I could do a page in probably 30 seconds. So it wasn't that big That's a deal. Still. Not like years or days or whatever to get it done. <laughs> it was, by that time, it was, oh my gosh, it's working. You know, yeah. I mean, because after a whole bunch, like I did at the, if you look on the archives, you look on the mailing list, you know, here it is. Okay, it's doing something, but it's not working. And okay, I got the program, Garrett, thank you. And oh, it's just generating FFs. That's not right. And I'm going to put it off for a little bit. And, and then I'm going to come back over the weekend and work on it. And I think when I figured it out, I sent an email right as I got it all figured out. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, you know, I think this date is right, but I'm going to bed. Right? I'll, come, I'll get up the next morning and, and, and figure it out later. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, well it was fun, it was fun to make it, it was fun to generate the information, I'm glad, I hope you guys had fun listening to it.